اولین همکاران نوجوان ما در این دوازدهمین کنفرانس هیلدا کسروی و پویان پرسفنداری هستند. Hilda Kasravi is 18 years old and is a senior at Huntington Beach High School. She has recently just applied to colleges and universities all around California. Uh, some of Hilda's hobbies include playing volleyball, watching TV, and hanging out with friends and family. Hilda has been attending the California Zoroastrian Center ever since she was a young girl and has taken Farsi, Avesta, Gatha, and ethics classes. Hilda believes that being a Zartoshti has allowed her to create a proper set of morals that guide her life and actions. This Mabed has been more than just a place for religious practice. And for her, has been a place where many of her childhood and current memories have been made. The friends and experiences she has gained from growing up in the Zoroastrian community are priceless and something she treasures every day. Puyane Puresvandiyari, born in Tehran on May 19, 1994, and grew up in Iran until he was 13. When his family decided to move to the United States, he was 17 years old. Um, when he was 13, when his family decided to move to the United States, he is 17 years old now and the 12th grader at Irvine High School. His favorite sport is basketball and water polo, and he wants to continue his education in the medical fields, hopefully after high school. Please join me to welcome Hilda and Puyan. Born in Daraban, Tehran on July 2nd, 1967, Dr. Daryayi went to Parvane Primary School in Abadan. In the 1976-1977 through 1977 academic year, he was sent to the United States and enrolled in Harker Academy, which was established in 1893 to be a feeder institution to Stanford. Dr. Daryayi returned to the Iran in the summer and lived through the revolution there in 1978-1979. In 1980, he went back to Harker Academy and then moved to Athens, Greece, and attended school there until 1981. He first attended the Campion School, a British academy, and then attended the American Community Schools of Athens. Dr. Dario Yi returned to Iran in 1982 and lived there until 1984, then came back to the United States. He did his PhD in history at the University of California, Los Angeles in 1999. He taught at California State University Fullerton from 1999 as a professor of history and then at the University of California, Irvine from 2007 to the present. Dr. Dayoyu's interests vary, but he mainly works on the Sasanian Empire, which was the major power in the Near East rivaling the Roman Empire. The reason he became interested in this ancient dynasty is because history is covered somewhat strangely in the U.S. in regards to the Middle East and Near Eastern regions. His main aim so far has been to introduce the Sasanian Empire as an integral part of late antique history and that of world history. Thus, he created a website with the help of Hale Embrani and Khodadad Rezakhani at UC Irvine to introduce the documents and material cultures culture relating to late antique Near East. World history is another favorite topic with Dr. Daryayi, actively which Dr. Daryayi actively teaches and works on. Besides his work with the Journal, Journal of World History, he has also co-authored a two-volume world history book, which is meant to be accessible and affordable to students and other readers.
بیاری ها رمزا دکتر تورج دریایی در روز دو جولای 1967 در شهر تهران متولد شدند و در دبستان پروانه در شهر آبادان شروع به تحصیل کردند پس از چندی در سال تحصیلی 1976 77 به آمریکا آمدند و در هارکر آکادمی ادامه تحصیل دادند دکتر دریایی در تابستان همان سال به ایران برگشتند و در مدت انقلاب ایران بین 1978 تا 79 را در ایران سپری کردند. سال 1980 ایشون به هارکر اکادمی در آمریکا برگشتند و بعد از یک سال برای ادامه تحصیل به شهر آتن یونان سفر کردند. در آتن ایشون به کمپین سکول و بعد به امریکن کمیونیتی سکولز اف آتن رفتند و در سال 1982 به ایران بازگشتند. تا سال 1984 در ایران زندگی کردند و دوباره به آمریکا برای گرفتن مدرک دکترای خود در تاریخ از دانشگاه لس آنجلس یا یو سی ای سفر کردند. در سال 1999 ایشون با مدرک دکترای خود از تاریخ فارغ التحصیل شدند و شروع به تدریس تاریخ در دانشگاه فولرتون و از سال 2007 تا کنون در دانشگاه اروان کردند. دکتر دریای علاقه زیادی به مطالب گوناگون دارند ولی از تاریخ دوره ساسانیان لذت زیادی میبرند. هدف ایشون ایجاد شناخت بیشتر در مورد این زمان از تاریخ ایرانیان است به خاطر اینکه در آمریکا این دوره از تاریخ خیلی کمرنگ به نظر میرسد و برای پیشرفت کارشان ایشون یک وبسایت در یو سی آی با کمک خانم حاله امرانی و خداداد رضاخانی درست کردند. که در این وبسایت علاقمندان مطالبی درباره این دوره از تاریخ رو میتونن مطالعه کنند. تاریخ جهان هم یکی از موضوعات مورد علاقه ایشون هست و همچنین در این باره تدریس میکنن. نویسنده یکی از کتاب های تاریخ جهان که برای دانش آموزان هم در نظر گرفته شده هم میباشند. در اینجا خواهش میکنم از آقای دکتر دریایی که بروی سن تشریف بیارن و ما را از سخنان زیبای خود بهرمند کنند. با سلام به حضور محترم با اجازه من از من خواستن که صحبتم رو به زبان انگلیسی بکنم به همین دلیل با پوزش این کار رو انجام میدم I would like to thank Mubed Yardepu, Mubed Vahidi, Khosro Mehfar and the uh, board of the Zoras, California Zoroastrian Center I'd like to thank them for their kind invitation. Uh, the title of the talk that I decided to give uh, to the youth mainly today uh, is the idea of nonviolence and peaceful coexistence in the Zoroastrian scripture. I would like to start with a personal note uh, which relates to the topic at hand. Almost two decades ago, as you heard, when I was a graduate student studying old Iranian and Indic languages, and also Gothic Avestan with one of the giants of Indo-Iranian studies. His name is Hans-Peter Schmidt at UCLA. We would see that there were vast disagreements on how to go about translating uh, the most ancient religious poetry of the Iranians, that is the Gathas of Zarathustra. Of course, in an academic setting, one had to mull over most of scholarly publications, discuss grammatical issues, and review the various opinions. However, I remember succinctly that Hans-Peter Schmidt uh, would say that, as Ashur Zarathustra would have said, one has to make up his or her own mind uh, about matters. And he really wasn't there to push me to that, this is the right interpretation or this is the right one interpretation. You have to do it yourself. Since 1995, I've tried on my own to look over the Gathas, so it's about 17 years and try to actually maybe make a small translation for myself. And the more I study these hymns, the more impressed I am with the concepts and ideas of a man who probably lived somewhere in Eastern Iran probably three, 4,000 years ago. That is a matter of, of course, discussion. I can say that the Gathas are hymns that are different than many other ancient texts uh, that were composed in antiquity. We shall see soon why they are very different. 
But even if there is a difference between the Gathas and many other texts and traditions, the question that revolves around this conference is what makes the Gathas relevant for the 21st century? What is it that the Gathas can bring forth uh, that is different perhaps from several other traditions that are dominant today in the United States and other places? The answer to this question, to answer it, I would like to actually take on or talk about briefly Yasna 29 uh, as an example. So I chose just one of the yasnas to uh, discuss it and see what is it that's special and maybe relevant to today. I think this yasna has been called at least by scholars, not by the community itself, as one of the most mystifying texts of the Gathas. This is not so much because the message it contains, but rather the main protagonist of Essen Gaushor Van, which if literally translated, it means the soul of the cow. Let me say that long time ago, in the 1960s, um, this literal, literal meaning of Gao Shorvan had come under question. A professor at the University of Chicago in 1968, George Cameron, had suggested that in fact, uh, Gao Shorvan is a metaphor for humanity, similar to the idea of flock in Christianity. That was one of the early translations and uh, suggestions. However, in 1975, my own professor, Hans Peter Schmidt, in his inaugural lectures at the University of Leiden as professor of Old Iranian, brought forth the idea that Gosh Orvan represents the good vision. And to make this idea better understood, I think his followers, such as Martin Schwartz at Berkeley, have uh, brought about the idea that, in a sense, Gosh Orvan means conscience of humanity. So if we could take this metaphorically as the conscience of humanity, rather than literally, let's see what this tells us. The name given to this Yasna 29 in the academic circles is Cow's Lamentation. And as Mohit Vahidi, I think, mentioned, the word Garajdam or Geristan and Lamentation at the first stanza uh, actually suggest that. Which, again, as we say, it means, if we take it metaphorically, as the lamentation of human conscience. Here, Gao Shurvan complains. For whom did you, Lord, shape me? Who made me? Kahmai ma trawajdam ke ma tashat. The reason Gaush Orvan is questioning the Lord is that what is happening in the world to it, namely violence. There's a term that is an old Iranian term that we still have today in Persian, khash, in a Western Aishma, and it's cognates, fury, and aggression. So one can say that the conscience of humanity is complaining about all the violence and the cruelty that this current world is also going through. Ahura Mazda proclaims that Zarathustra is chosen to lead humanity amidst this turbulent world. The crux of the matter is this. What is one to do when the world is engaged in a nasty and violent state? This is an issue that not only then, but I think especially today, uh, we grapple with. All you have to do is just to turn on the news, which I try not to. What is one to do in this hectic and violent world? In Zarathustra's time, there are those whose religious visions were contrary to his, of course, and was per perhaps established on violence, killing of animals, stealing, and a state of fury. The answer by the wise lord, our Mazda, and through Zarathustra is rather in line with the great religions of the East, such as Buddhism and also Hinduism, which come after Zoroastrianism. I believe Zarathustra's message should be placed within this Indo-Iranian tradition to be better understood, rather than the usual tradition when we compare these things with Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. But what does Buddhism, and more closely akin to Zoroastrianism, that is Hinduism, say? There is something, I think, at the core of the Zoroastrian tradition that is very important and less discussed. But we see that discussed very much in the universities when it comes to Zoroastrianism, or Buddhism for that matter. And that is an idea in Sanskrit that is called ahimsa. Ahimsa means non-violence to living beings. That is the utmost respect for living things, okay? 
and i.e. a peaceful existence and a lack of violence. This is very much at the core of this Eastern tradition, which Zoroastrianism is the earliest manifestation of it, and then later on Buddhism and Hinduism. Well, such a concept, as I've mentioned, also exists in Zoroastrianism, which is, I think, less discussed. In the five gathas, Zarathustra mentions the word for peace, Rama, and tranquility, Hushoit, more than most other emotions and state of beings. That, I believe, has been less of a topic of discussion. And if you're questioning where does he get this, well, let's just look at some of the things that Zarathustra says. Yasna 47.3. And I spare you of my Avestan reading and uh, just go to the English translation. Um, you, Lord, are the Holy Father of the Spirit, who has, Lord, created for us the cow, the source of all good fortune, and also right-mindedness, establishing peace for her pasture. Now, if we take this pasture and the cow metaphorically, we're talking about something else, just not literally pasture. And it could be interpreted both ways. Again, here in 47.3, we come across the cow and the pasture, as I've mentioned, uh, which is trying to be discussed in a state of uh, peace and tranquility. In 48.11, we get the same idea. When, O oh Lord, will right-mindedness come with truth, with Asha? Arrive with power, provided with good dwelling and pasture, Vastra. Who are those that will give peace, Rama, for the bloodthirsty wicked? And there are many more instances that you come across this term and the idea of peace. In Yasna 29, our own Yasna, of course, that we're discussing, the clearest manifestation is actually of peace is discussed here as well. Lord, grant to those people or human strength and the rule of truth and of good thinking by means of which one shall create peace and tranquility. This good vision or conscience is not solely a mental state, but a physical state as well. It has been observed to rule according to Asha, the truth, and good thinking, Vahumana, in peace and tranquility is the opposite of exactly what was going on then, and I would say in many ways what is going on today. That is what Zarathustra is opposed to and what the soul of the cow laments in this world. In the face of violence, Zarathustra preaches peace. In the face of chaos, Zarathustra preaches tranquility. If we were to bring these ideas to the modern period, I don't think there is much far difference from what uh, Mahatma Gandhiji, as you just mentioned, talked about, or for that matter, the people, uh, Martin Luther King that we think about or study in our classrooms today in the United States. This idea of peace and tranquility in the face of violence. Some may say that this is a very nice idea and all religions have similar ideas more or less. But what can counter that these tenets have been put into practice at least in the history of Zoroastrianism? At least for the past 1,000 years, wherever the Zoroastrians have been, they have been one of the most peaceful communities in the world, be it in Yazd and Kerman, or, or Mumbai or Gujarat, or Westminster, where we are. They have kept this tradition of nonviolence and tranquility. Since I am not a Zoroastrian, I can make such a statement as a scholar and a historian of the tradition, not based on my emotional affinity, but rather a logical deduction and a study of history. But for those who follow Zoroastrianism, from time to time it is good to be told about their own tradition from the outside, to highlight some of the important ideas which at times may get lost in the details and ritual of life. I would like to end by also trying to be independent of mind. How about if we don't take the general scholarly view and don't take the idea that the soul of the cow is a metaphor? What if we take things literally? As I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, Zarathustra said that each person should make up their own de decisions. What would then the lamentation of the cow mean for us today? We know that in the Indo-European society, and especially in the Indo-Iranian society, the cow was held to be very precious. And I think uh, Mr. Debu also touched upon that in the beginning of his talk. 
After all, a good example also not only in the Iranian world is in the Germanic world, where Vergild, or the worth of a human, was based on the cow. That's how it was actually uh, accosted for. Perspective is of utmost importance here. If one is a vegetarian, let's say, or someone who believes in nonviolence to the animal world, where the cattle represents the entirety of this animal world in this Iranian world, the violence being done to it is being voiced by not the cow, obviously cows don't speak, but rather the conscience of the cow, the most peaceful of the animal. Thus, one can also interpret the Asna 29 as one of the earliest manifestations of nonviolence to animal life. After all, in antiquity, people ate very little meat, and that was a communal meat where also uh, a portion of it was, of course, sacrificed. Perhaps Zarathustra here is protesting against the excessive killing of the cow and the irrational uh, slaughter of the bovine. This makes perfect sense. In Zoroastrianism, along with other Indo-European societies, the bovine is sacred. After all, in, Indo in ancient Iranian language, the term for uh, uh, the cow, but more what we use today as Gusvand, the sheep is Gauspanta, sacred cow, holy cow. I think either way, we see a non-violent attitude towards animal life and the world which can be a model for Zoroastrians and non-Zoroastrians alike today. There are lots of things that one can learn from moral and thoughtful texts of antiquity. One just has to read them today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such a well-said speech, Dr. Diary, and an interesting topic. Um, we now open the floor to any questions. The word cow has been explained in the Avesta. In the Avesta, we have Pancha Gava, that there are five Gav. And then it says human beings, animals who are our, uh, I mean the animals we have, we take care, animals on the, uh, on the earth, animals in the air, and animals in the sea. That means cow covers all the whole animal world, and not only human beings, all of us. And therefore, the peace is for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you that question. We know that in the history of uh, Persia, we have uh, witnessed much uh, violence throughout the years and all dynasties. A time of Sasanians. I am interested to know your point of view of uh, trying to interrelate what happened that they had so much violence against the other religions, Mazdaks and Mani. Whereas, according to what you say, and according to what we all believe, the nonviolence is the essence of Zoroastrian religion. Can you make an interrelation between what the, philosophically speaking, uh, essence of man's authority does when it is mixed with religion? Thank you. Sure. Uh, Dr. Amirjad, this is, a, of course, a very good question that, of course, can stun a lot of people. How could you have these incessant warfares from the Achaemenid period all the way to the Sasanian times, and then also have an ideology of peace and nonviolence. Uh, for one thing is that we have to see what their interpretation of the Sasanians was of the Gathas, how they read through this, right, in their translation, and the Achaemenids and whatnot. But the other thing I think that is very much understandable today is you have 
uh, religious ideas that may look very good and people may be pro, you know, saying that we are followers of this religion, but once the state, they come into power and religion and state mixes a little bit, uh, things turn out to be very different than the very much idyllic and proscriptive uh, visions of the prophets of these religions. And they tend to be uh, not so nice at times. So just briefly to put that.